well, there's a more general question, of course, about uh, um, whether um, the human race as such is something which is uh, uh, very special, or if, on the other hand, um, it's just one of many such species elsewhere in the universe, or indeed existing at different times in our universe. It, it to me, it feels uh, almost obvious that the universe should be full of alien life, perhaps dead alien civilizations, but just the the, the vastness of space, and yes. it just feels wrong to think of Earth as somehow special. It sure as heck doesn't look that special. When you, the more we learn, the less special it seems. Well, I mean, I don't agree with that as far as, as life is concerned, because uh, remember that we don't understand how life began here on Earth. Yes. Uh, we don't understand, although we know that we're in evolution of simple life to complex life, we don't understand uh, what caused the transition between complex chemistry and the first um, replicating, metabolizing entity we call alive. Yes. That's a mystery. Um, and... Uh, uh, serious physicists and, are, and chemists are now thinking about it, but we don't, we don't know. So we therefore can't say, was it a rare fluke? Yeah. Which would not have happened anywhere else? Or was it something which uh, involves a process that would have happened in any other planet where conditions were like they were on the young Earth? Um, so we, we can't say that now. Um, I, I think well, many of us would indeed bet that probably some kind of life exists elsewhere. But even if um, you accept that, then um, there are many contingencies going from simple life to um, uh, present day life. And, and some biologists like Stephen Jay Gould uh, have thought that if you reran evolution, you'd end up with something quite different, and maybe not with an intelligent species. So the uh, contingencies in evolution um, may militate against the emergence of intelligence even if life gets started in lots of places. So, so I think these are still completely open questions. And that's why it's such an exciting time now that we are starting to be able to address these. I mean, I mentioned the, uh, uh, the fact that the origin of life is a question that we may be able to understand, um, and serious people are working on it. It's usually put in the sort of too difficult box. Everyone knew it was important, but they didn't know how to tackle it or what experiments to do. But it's not like that now. And... Um, that's partly because of clever experiments, but I think most importantly because um, we are aware that we can look for life in other places, other places in our solar system, and of course on the exoplanets around other stars. And uh, within 10 or 20 years, I think two things could happen, which would be really, really important. We might, with the next big telescope, be able to image some of the Earth-like planets around other stars. Image, like it, get a picture. Well, well I, actually, let me caveat that. It'd take 50 years to get a resolved image, but, <laughs> but, but, but to actually detect the light. Because now, now of course, the, these exoplanets are detected by their effect on the parent star. They either cause the, their parent star to dim slightly when they transit across in front of it, and so we see the dips, or uh, their gravitational pull makes the star wobble a bit. So, so most of the, the 5,000 plus planets that have been found around other stars, they've been found indirectly by their effect Yes, in one of those two ways on the parent star. You could still star. do a pretty good job of estimating size, yeah. all those kinds of size things. And the size and the mass, you can estimate. Um, but but, uh, um, but, but det detecting the, the actual light from one of these exoplanets hasn't really been done yet, except in one or two very... Very, very bright, big planets. So maybe um, like James Webb Telescope would be... Well, able. James Webb may do this, but even better will be um, the European ground-based telescope called unimaginatively the Extremely Large Telescope, which has a 39-meter <laughs> diameter mirror. 39 meters, uh, yeah. mosaic of 800 sheets of glass, and that will collect enough light from one of these exoplanets around a nearby star um, to be able to... Um, separate out its light from that of the star, which is a million of times brighter, and get the spectrum of the planet mm -hmm. and see if it's got uh, oxygen or chlorophyll and things in it. Uh, so that, that, that will come. Um, J James Webb may, may make some, some steps there. Um, but 
I think we can look forward to learning quite a bit um, in the next 20 years because I like to say, um, supposing that were aliens looking at the solar system, then they'd see the sun as an ordinary star, they'd see the Earth as, in Carl Sagan's nice phrase, a pale blue dot lying very close in the sky to its star, our sun, and much, much, much fainter. But if they could observe that dot, they could learn quite a bit. They could perhaps get the spectrum of the light and find the atmosphere. They'd find the shade of blue was slightly different, depending on whether the Pacific Ocean or the land mass of Asia was facing them, so they could infer the length of the day and the two oceans and continents, and maybe something about the seasons and the climate. And uh, that's the kind of calculation, calculation and, and uh, inference we might be able to draw within the next 10 or 20 years about other exoplanets and um, uh, and evidence of some sort of biosphere on one of them would, of course, be crucial, and it would rule out the uh, still logical possibility that life is unique. But there's another way in which this may happen in the next 20 years. People think there could be something swimming under the ice of uh, Europa and Enceladus, and probes are being sent to maybe not quite go under the ice, but detect the spray coming coming out to see if there's evidence for organics in that. And if we found any evidence for an origin of life that had happened in either of those places, that would immediately be important, because if life has originated twice independently in one planetary system, the solar system, that would tell us straight away it wasn't a rare accident and must have happened billions of times in the galaxy. At the moment, we can't rule out it being unique. And incidentally, if we found life on Mars, then that would still be ambiguous because uh, um, people have realized that this early life could have got from Mars to Earth or vice versa on yeah. meteorites. So um, if you found life on Mars, then some skeptics could still say if it's a single origin. Um, but I think... But Europa is far enough... That's far enough away. Statistically yeah, yeah. because... Yes, so, so, so that's why that would be especially... It's always the concerned. skeptics that, that yeah. ruin a good party. But, <laughs> <laughs> but we but need the, them, of course. We need them at the party. We need yeah. some yeah, skeptics yeah. at the party. Yeah. Um, but the, boy, would that be so exciting to find life <laughs> mm. on one of the moons. Yeah, yeah. It means but of course, uh, that life that's is everywhere. Probably the, that would just be any kind of vegetation or life. Um, the question of the um, aliens of science fiction is a different matter. Intelligent aliens. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah but if, if you have a good indication that there's life elsewhere in the solar system, that means life is everywhere. Yep. And that, yep. that's, that, 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 yeah. I don't know if that's terrifying or what that is, because if life is everywhere, why is intelligent life not everywhere? Why, I mean, you've talked about that most likely alien civilizations, if they are out there, they would likely be far ahead of us. The ones that would actually communicate with us. Yes. And that, um, again, one of those things that is both exciting and terrifying. You, you've mentioned that they're likely not to be of biological nature. Well, I think that that's important. Of course, again, it's a speculation, but... Uh, uh, in speculating about um, intelligent life. And I, I take the search seriously. In fact, I chair the uh, committee that the um, Russian-American investor, Yuri Milner, supports looking for um, intelligent life. He's putting $10 million a year into uh, better equipment and getting time on telescopes to do this. And so I think it's worthwhile, even though I, I don't hold my breath for success. It's, it's very exciting. But, but that does lead me to wonder what, might be detected. And um, uh, I think, well, we don't know. We've got to be open minds about anything. We've no idea what it will be. <laughs> and so any anomalous objects or even some strange shiny objects in the solar system or anything we've got to keep our eyes open for. But uh, I think um, if we ask what about a um, planet like the Earth where evolution had taken more of the same track, mm -hmm. then as you say, it wouldn't be synchronized. Um, if it uh, had lag behind, then of course it would not have got to advanced life, uh, but it may have had a head start. It may have formed on a planet around an older star. Okay, But then let's ask what we would see. Um, it's taken nearly four billion years from the first life to us, and we've now got this technological civilization 
which uh, um, could make itself detectable um, to any alien life, uh, aliens out there. Um, but I think most people would say that this civilization of flesh and blood creatures in a collective civilization may not last more than a few hundred years more. I think that the dead people may, some people would say it, it, it will um, kill itself off. Um, but uh, I'm more optimistic, and I would say that uh, um, what we're going to have in future is um, no longer the slow Darwinian selection, but we're going to have what I call secular intelligent design, which will be um, uh, humans designing um, uh, their progeny to be better adapted to where they are. And uh, if they go to Mars or some, somewhere, they're badly adapted and they want to adapt a lot. Uh, and so uh, they will adapt. Um, but there may be some limits to what could be done with flesh and blood. And so they may become largely electronic, um, download their brains and, have, and be electronic entities. And if they're electronic, then what's important is that they're near immortal. And also, they won't necessarily want to be on a planet with an atmosphere or gravity. They may go off into the blue yonder. And, they, and if they're near immortal, they won't be daunted by interstellar travel taking a long time. And so um, uh, if, if we looked at what would happen on the Earth in the next millions of years, then there may be these electronic entities which have been sent out and are now far away from the Earth, but still sort of burping away in some in some fashion to be detected. Um, and so uh, this um, this therefore leads me to think that um, if there was another planet which had evolved like the Earth and was ahead of us, uh, it wouldn't be synchronized, so we wouldn't see a flesh and blood civilization, but we would see these electronic progeny, as it were. Um, and, and then this raises another question, because um, there's the famous argument against there being um, uh, lots of aliens out there, which is that they would um, come and invade us and eat us or something like that. You know, that's a common idea, uh, which sort of Fermi is attributed to have been the first to say. Um, and I think there's a um, escape clause to that, because these um, entities... Yeah. would be, uh, say, that they evolved by secular intelligent design, designed by their predecessors and then designed by us. Um, and uh, um, whereas Darwinian selection requires two things, it requires aggression and intelligence, this future intelligent design um, uh, may favor intelligence because that's what they were designed for, but it may not favor aggression. And so these future entities, they... They may be um, sitting deep thoughts, thinking deep thoughts, um, and uh, not being at all expansionist. So they could be out there. Yeah. Um, and we can't refute their existence in the way the Fermi paradox is supposed to re refute their existence, because um, these would not be aggressive or expansionist. Well, maybe evolution requires competition, not aggression. And I wonder if competition can take forms that are non-expansionary. So you can still have fun competing yeah, yeah. in the space of ideas, which maybe primarily- They'd all be philosophers, perhaps, yeah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> in, in a way, right. It's, a, it's an intellectual exercise versus a sort of violent exercise.